is the fifth chapter. We're going to begin at verse number 6 and read through verse number 10. Amen. I want to talk to the church today on the topic, Love Conquers All. Hallelujah. Love <coughs> Conquers All. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, the King James text today reads as follows. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life hallelujah love conquers all if you bow your heads with me one more moment father once again god we come to you grateful for the word of the lord grateful for the presence of god grateful lord for the house of god a place where we can go and we can experience your presence, your power, your glory. Place where the joy of the Lord can be restored to our hearts, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. A place where the peace of God can once again be found, for the peace of God passeth all understanding. Master, as the Word of God would go forth at this hour, I pray that the anointing of the great Holy Ghost would rest upon the messenger of the gospel. Lord, men and women strive to preach about you, but it is the anointing that allows us to introduce those who would hear, those who would receive. It is the anointing that allows us to introduce them to you personally. For your presence is very real. And you help, O oh God, to inform the listener that that which they hear is truth. It is real. And it is a word from heaven that is able to set them free and to save and to heal and to deliver. Anoint today, O oh God, not only my lips, but also the ears of everyone that would hear. Let us today have a heart and a mind that is willing to receive from your word this hour. Communicate to us by your great Holy Ghost, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. amen. I am going to have to take my jacket off. I am burning up. I try as much as I'm able not to have to remove my jacket. They say Ronald Reagan would not even go into the Oval Office without a suit jacket on. And he did so <clears throat> because he held the office of president in such high esteem. And he considered it such an honor to sit at a desk where Abraham Lincoln once sat. And he said, I cannot degrade. I cannot fail to pay homage 
to the wonderful history of this nation and to the service of our former presidents. He said, I can't do it. I, I just can't go into the Oval Office without a tire that I feel is uh, appropriate. Well, I'm going to tell you, this old preacher still believes that men and women of God owe it to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to look like they are trying to represent Him and represent Him well. I get sick and tired of preachers getting up wearing flip-flops and jeans and t-shirts because they want to somehow communicate that God is cool. Why don't you communicate that God is worthy of reverence? Why don't you communicate that God is worthy of some effort on your part? I'm sorry, that's just a pet peeve of mine. So I try desperately to keep my jacket on, but I have a, I'm very susceptible to the heat. And literally, I don't want to pass out up here in front of you because I'm overcome by the heat. And unfortunately, uh, the room that we use for our sanctuary uh, has windows all around, and it is hot in this room in this extremely hot Texas heat. Romans 5, 6 through 10. The message of the gospel, my friend, is a message of love. It was the love of God that put the man Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It was the love of God which caused him before the foundations of the world to formulate a plan which would allow for his creation to love him in response to his act of love on our behalf. The gospel is very much a love story. It calls us to faith. It calls us to believe the gospel, the message. But not simply because we are commanded to do so, but because we are enticed by the love that God has extended toward us. In 1 John 4, 19, the writer John said, We love Him because He first loved us. Mm -hmm. We believe the gospel today because we love a God who could go to such lengths to create a way for us to have a personal, intimate relationship with Him. He does not force His will upon us, but rather He reaches out to us in love and invites us to love Him back. Listen to me, children. Rejection of the Gospel is as much about rejecting the love of God as it is about rejecting faith. Did you hear what I said? Rejection of the gospel is as much, if not more, about rejecting the love of God than it is rejecting faith. As our hearts are touched and we feel that flutter of love and appreciation for all that God has done for us, He goes yet one step further and places the seed of faith within us so that we might begin our faith journey with Him. In Ephesians 2 and 8, the Word of God declares, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. What is not of yourselves? The faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is God's motivation for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. 
But faith to embrace and believe the gospel is a gift from God which enables us to begin our journey with Him. The seed of faith that God places within us when nurtured and fertilized grows and matures. As it grows, so too grows our intimacy with the Master. In 1 John 3, 1 and 2, the writer John writes, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. God's love for us is so great that even as we remain sinful creatures in a sin-infected world, he calls us his children. Only a parent can appreciate the love that one holds for their own offspring. A parent can be patient and kind, and they can overlook so much from their own child that a bystander with no emotional connection to that child would be willing to overlook. Even an aunt or an uncle, a brother or sister, a grandmother or cousin can overlook things that one who is not family may find hard to ignore. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I've got nephews and nieces. I love, I love being an uncle. I've got nephews and nieces. They're not my offspring. They're not my child. Yet at the same time, I can still be more patient with them. I can still overlook things that they do that others might find off-putting or, or others might get frustrated or aggravated with. Why? It's simple. Because I love them. They're my family. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I've got news for you today. There's a reason why God is able to call us His children even though we still are subject to sin. As long as we're in a flesh and blood body, we're subject to sin. We're subject to failure. We're subject to weaknesses and faults. And God knows that. But there's a reason why He is still willing to call us His children, even though we are yet in this condition. And that reason is simply this. He loves us. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. Oh, I love what John said, and I love the way he said it. Behold, what manner of love the Father. He uses the title the Father. He doesn't use the title God. He uses the title the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Hallelujah. What manner of love the Father hath made. It's because He loves us that He can call us today His sons, His daughters, His children. Glory to God. The power of love is unimaginable. Love, according to the Apostle Paul, is capable of so much. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, Paul describes love in this fashion. He said, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with 
the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Amen. That is today from the NIV version for clarity of understanding. My word, love, sounds like an awful powerful thing. Amen. Amen. Love sounds like a marvelous attribute to have. Solomon expressed in his book of wisdom that love is capable of providing cover for a multitude of sins. Not just a few or even many, but a multitude. When we contemplate how in the world it is possible that the creator of the universe could accept us and call us his own, while we are yet bound to an existence of sin and human frailty, the conflict seems overwhelming. But when you understand that God not only loves as a verb, but that His very nature is love as a noun, suddenly, it all comes into clear focus. Proverbs 10 and verse 12, Solomon wrote, Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. In John 3, verses 16 and 17, the word of the Lord declares, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. One of the most beautiful writings in the Word of God concerning the power and the capabilities of love is found in Romans 8 verses 35 through 39. The Apostle Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, love's a powerful thing. There's an old saying that we like to use, and it simply says, love conquers all. Meaning, if you have love, you have all you need. Amen. There are a lot of people who believe today, or want to believe today, that if you have love, that love conquers all, and every marriage can be saved, provided the partners love one another. I've got news for you, that is not the case. You need something more in a marriage than simply love. If you don't have commitment, then honey, you are out of luck. Your, your car is out of gas. You're not going to be able to get very far. The thing that drives me crazy when I am trying to uh, counsel with couples who are going through marital trouble, the thing that drives me crazy is when uh, they try to say, you know, oh, but we have love, and love's supposed to conquer all. No, in that instance, it does not. Where is your commitment? Are you committed to one another in spite of any trouble that 
might come your way. I've told people, I've told you, preaching many times, I have a question that I, and of course I'm giving people the answer, so if it ever comes down to it now, they're going to know the answer ahead of time. But I ask a question when I'm offering couples getting married pre-marital counseling, and I like to ask them, what is the deal breaker for you? What is that one thing that should your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife, should they cross what line and you'd be willing to exit your marriage and you'd be willing at that point to move on from your marriage and get a divorce. And so what is the one thing that you just cannot abide? Well, now you can take a wild guess at what the majority of people will answer. Most people, almost without fail, are going to answer infidelity. If my spouse commits adultery, if my spouse steps out on me, it's over. I will not abide. I will not put up with such things. That's what most people will answer. And my answer to that then is this. Okay, y'all go home and cancel your wedding because you're not ready for marriage. You're not. When you already have in your mind an anticipation, you already have a condition set in your mind for what will be a line crossed that you will not permit and you will not put up with. When you go into a commitment or you go into a marriage with something in your mind already, then friend, you've already lost half the battle right there. Your commitment knows boundaries. You have already committed yourself to a certain level of commitment. Am I telling the truth? There are many people, I'm sorry to bring up Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton as an example, but there are many people who have endured infidelity in their marriage and yet they remained committed to their marriage. Am I telling the truth? And I'm going to tell you, a lot of people, I'm not recommending you go out and commit adultery for this purpose. Don't misunderstand me. But a lot of people report that after an infidelity, it does bring tremendous hurt. It does bring tremendous pain. It does require tremendous effort to overcome and to work through this. However, many couples will tell you that after such an experience as this, they and their spouse wind up finding an even deeper level of commitment and love than they ever experienced before. One of my favorite sitcoms, I don't want to set off a great deal of, of uh, trouble by saying this, but one of my favorite old sitcoms is All in the Family. I won't go into great detail, but I believe Norman uh, Lear did this country a great service by bringing a British comedy to America and creating an American version of it, which was called All in the Family. It was hard to watch. It was, it dealt with subject matter that in the 70s, especially when it first aired on television, it was, it was hard to watch because it literally forced people to look at racism and to look at prejudice it forced them to look in the mirror and to see themselves and I'm telling you I believe that Norman Lear did this country a great service by helping to produce that program because 
I had a grandmother who was full of any number of prejudices. Honestly, to be truthful with you, if you mention somebody's uh, national origin, you know, their background, uh, be they Polish or German or Russian or uh, Italian or Jewish or whatever, you, you, my grandmother would sit there and tell you all the stereotypes associated with that particular group of people. She knew every one of them. She had them all down pat. But you know what? When all of the family came on television and all of a sudden Grandma would start saying some of the stupid things she loved to say. And some of us in the family would kind of laugh and we'd say, Oh yeah, Archie, go ahead, Archie. And she'd get so aggravated. I'm not Archie, I'm not Archie. Nobody wanted to be Archie Munker. Nobody wanted to be associated with his ignorance and his stupidity. But you know what? When people start teasing you about being Archie and resembling Archie, it made people look at themselves and think about what they were doing and how they were doing it. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And they would offer statistics during the course of the program on any given show. And usually it would be either Mike or Gloria who would be offering literal, real numbers and real statistics on issues ranging from homosexuality and cross-dressing to uh, minority issues and poverty, you know. And, and, and Norman uh, Lear had these characters literally offering real information that a lot of people would never sit down and read. They would never study. They would never try to learn these things. But watching this show that made them laugh suddenly they're exposed to information they weren't exposed to before. So I loved All in the Family. But in All in the Family, there was one episode where Archie had a little brief liaison with a woman who worked in a diner that he frequented. And he wound up kissing this woman. And he didn't have an adulterous affair, but he kissed her. Long story short, Edith wound up, uh, his wife wound up becoming aware of this, of this event. And of course it hurt her deeply and they wound up going through a little bit of a separation and, and all this. And then finally they came back together. And it was so sweet when they came back together. But the one episode I really liked is when sometime later Archie had bought this place of business and the woman he had this little kiss with wound up coming in and getting a job there while Archie wasn't there. His partner hired her. He didn't know Archie's history with her. And Archie comes in and he sees this woman there and of course, you know, he's horrified. And then at one point, Edith comes in to the bar. Oh my goodness, and there's the woman he had this kiss with, and there's his wife. And he's just scared out of his mind. He doesn't want his wife to think he had anything to do with this, you know, and all that. Well, long story short, at one point, Edith begins to talk to this woman. She just is talking to her, you know, and they're talking. And as they're talking, all of a sudden, Edith realizes who she's talking to. Because she had made the effort after learning of Archie's little tryst. She had made the effort to go to this diner and see this woman years ago. And all of a sudden she realizes, oh my Lord, this is the same woman. And the woman realizes that Edith has recognized her. And she says, I'm so sorry. You know, said, I can tell you nothing happened. And Edith says, I know. Well, I'm trying to be quick about this little anecdote. But the long story and the short of it is this. At one point, Edith says to this woman, I want to thank you. <laughs> and this woman says, thank me? Why in the world would you say you want to thank me? She said, because... 
after that happened, Archie and I found a place in our relationship that we had never before experienced and we had never before known. Pastor, what are you getting at? What I'm getting at is this. If you're going to go into a marriage committed, then you've got to be committed without any lines being drawn in the sand. You've got to be ready to deal with whatever comes. Now listen, if you're marrying somebody you're afraid may do thus and so, then you're probably marrying the wrong person. And I tell the truth. Amen. If you're worried about that going into your marriage, then honey, you, you might ought not to be getting married and certainly not to that person. But you've got to go in with commitment because in human relationships, love does not conquer all. Why doesn't it? I'll tell you why. Because as human beings, we really don't know how to love. You remember that description of love that I read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 13? How many of us that describes how we love? is patient, is kind, is not envious. Hello now. How many of us can say that that's how we love? No, no, no. We can. But you see, the Word of God doesn't say that God loves us. The Word of God says, listen to me, children, that God is love. His very nature is love. All those things that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that were descriptive of love are things that describe God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Because God is love. And because God is love and we don't know how to love, our love tends to run out of patience. Our love sometimes can get mean. Am I telling the truth? Sometimes our love gets angry. Sometimes our love seeks out revenge <laughs> or vengeance. But God is love. And because God is love, and because love is as it is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, then my friend, God is committed to His people in a way that we cannot ever be committed. And when it comes to God and His people, love does conquer all. That's why Paul said, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes down this big list. He's saying love conquers all. There is nothing that can possibly get in the way and disturb God's love toward you and I today. I'm going to tell you something. When you become a born again child of God, God is working on your behalf. He is doing everything in His power to help you succeed and to make heaven your home and to one day look Him in the eye face to face and see Him as He is. There is nothing in God. Nothing in God. Oh, hallelujah, I want to shout a little bit. There is nothing in God that wants you to fail. There is nothing in God that is pleased when you slip or when you falter. There is nothing in God whatsoever that wants any one of His children to fail to make heaven their home. That's not the God I heard preached a lot of times growing up as a kid. No, the God I heard, man, I mean to tell you, He was just standing there waiting to smack you on the head every time you fell, every time you faltered, every time a weakness manifested itself. But I'm here to tell you today, according to the Word of God, that is not the God we serve. The God we serve is love. And Love conquers all. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared, listen, for them that love Him. Who did God prepare unimaginable things for? He's prepared unimaginable things for them that love Him. The Lord God has created an unimaginable world of glory for those who love Him. Rejection of the gospel is the rejection of God's love. He does not share the glories of the world to come with those who have rejected His love. Listen to me, children. But He reserves those things for who? For those who in fact have responded to His love by loving Him in return. Hallelujah. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. Oh my goodness. Most see the harshness of hell and eternal damnation and punishment as an excessive penalty for one simply rejecting the gospel. But in reality, the punishment is this. Unbelievers, listen to me now carefully, unbelievers will exist in an environment that reflects that which they embraced in this life. They rejected God. They rejected His grace. They rejected His love. They rejected His presence and His power. So they will simply sleep in the bed that they've created for themselves. You know the old saying, you made the bed, now sleep in it, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to simply, Tommy, they're simply going to have to sleep in the bed they made for themselves. Oh, you wanted to believe that life was better without God. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret. The Word of God says that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Guess what the Word of God said hell is like? The Bible said they were cast into outer darkness. Are you hearing me now? You see, everything God is, you rejected and Therefore, you're going to experience existence away from everything that God is. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You didn't want the love of God, so you're not going to experience the love of God. You didn't want the presence of God, so you're not going to experience the presence of God. You didn't want the... Uh, the light of God, you're not going to experience the light of God. You prefer the Bible said that men love darkness more than light. Am I telling the truth? Well, guess what? If that's what you want is darkness, you're going to get what you wanted. So, the concept of punishment is not something excessive or ridiculous. No. God is giving them what they wanted. I want a life without God. I want a life without light. I want a life, a life without restrictions. They rejected God. They rejected His grace. They rejected, and now they're going to lie in the bed that they've created for themselves. If you stand so convinced that a world without God is the world you would rather live in, guess what? You will be given that opportunity. <laughs> what a sad thing to forfeit those things which God has created for them that love Him. Simply because we prefer to reject the love of God that was manifested on the cross of Calvary. 
love does conquer all. There is nothing love cannot do but unrequited love can do little. We benefit from love, listen, only when we choose to accept it and to return it in kind. How many times have you known somebody I hate to say it, but I'll use my own father as an example. My father is a, a mentally ill, narcissistic human being. You can try to love my father till the cows come home. And that man is not going to accept your love. He's not going to receive your love, am I telling the truth? And because he cannot accept it and receive it, guess what he can't do? He can't give love back. It's impossible. Just like a certain demon who occupied the White House recently. Man doesn't know what love is, doesn't know how to love anybody, and because he can't receive love, he can't give love back. I'm here to tell you today, folks, this is the problem that God has with humanity. When we reject the gospel, we are rejecting His love. When we reject His love and we don't accept it and receive it, then it's impossible then for us to give it back. Am I telling the truth? Mm. But God is a... He's created unimaginable things for those of us that love Him. We benefit from love only when we choose to accept it and to return it in kind. So long as we reject the love of God, he is powerless to include us in His plans for the saints. But when we accept His love and we return love to Him in response to all that He has done for us, He has promised a world of unimaginable joys and pleasures for those who will constitute His love interest and what the Word of God describes as His bride. Hallelujah. The church is called His bride. The bride is not one that simply has accepted God's love, but it's one who's accepted His love and then loved Him back. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God today. <laughs> the church today can say, thank God. Love conquers all. Hallelujah.